ionization energies. The first ionization energy can be defined as the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms to form one mole of gaseous one plus ions. So in other words, ionization energy is measuring how much energy is required to remove electrons from atoms. In this case, the first ionization energy is removing that first electron from an atom and turning it into a plus one ion. And this would be the equation for element X. You could swap this for any other element, for example, sodium, magnesium, even chlorine. Sometimes they could ask you to write down the second ionization energy and the third, etc. So for the second, we're simply just going to go up one more level. In this case, we're going to start with a plus one ion and remove another electron to form a two plus ion. And for the third ionization energy, it's going to be from two plus to three plus, etc. Now questions involving ionization energies have a lot to do with trends in the periodic table. There are three main trends that we have to learn about. The first one are trends across a period, for example, across period two or across period three, etc. The second trends are down groups, in this case, down group one, down group two, down group three, and so on. And the third type of question involves successive ionization energies. This is when we pick a random element, for example, sodium, and imagine that here we have the nucleus and the electrons are represented by these petals. All we're going to do is take this atom and keep removing electron after electron until we remove all the electrons from this atom. And then from this, we can learn more about the atom. Now, before we get into that, let's quickly talk about the factors that affect ionization energy. So in an atom, we know that all the electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus. So what affects the amount of energy required to remove this electron? One factor is distance, or in other words, atomic radius. So the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron. If distance increases, or in other words, an electron is further away from the nucleus, that means it will be easier to remove this electron. This means we won't have to use as much energy, so the ionization energy will be lower. The second factor is called shielding. So we know that electrons hate each other because they're all negatively charged and they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So let's say we're trying to remove this outermost electron. We know that it's attracted to the nucleus. However, between this electron and the nucleus, we have layer upon layer of other electrons. And all these shells in between are pushing the electron away from the nucleus. So if there's more shielding, i.e. more shells between the nucleus and the outermost electron, that means it will be easier to remove this outermost electron. And again, this will lower the ionization energy. The third factor is nuclear charge. We know that all the electrons are attracted to a positively charged nucleus. If an atom has more protons in its nucleus, this will cause the nuclear charge to increase. And therefore, there will be more attraction between the electrons and the nucleus. Also, this nucleus will pull all the electrons inwards, reducing the atomic radius. Both a stronger attraction and a smaller atomic radius will make it more difficult for us to remove the outermost electron. And this will increase the ionization energy. We can refer to these three factors as disk, distance, shielding, and nuclear charge. Remember, when distance and shielding increase, this lowers the ionization energy. However, when nuclear charge increases, this increases the ionization energy. Okay, now that we know the factors, let's put this into practice by looking at the first trend. We're going to start by looking at the trend 
down a group. So in this example, we'll use group one. And the question is, what happens to the first ionization energy as I go down the group? For example, if I remove one electron from each of these atoms, will it get easier or will it get harder? Or will it be the same? To answer the question, we're going to refer to distance, shielding and charge. So, as we go down the group, we can see that the distance between the outermost electron and the nucleus is increasing. In terms of shielding, again, as you go down the group, there's more shielding. For example, in the first one, we have one shell between the nucleus and the outermost electron. In the second one, there are two shells between the nucleus and the outermost electron. There are three in the third one and four in the fourth one. So the pattern is that the lower you go down the group, the distance and shielding between the nucleus and the outermost electron both increase. So based on this, that means overall the ionization energy as we go down the group should become lower meaning it should be easier to remove the outermost electron from the lowest element compared to the highest. However, there's still one more factor that we have to consider, and that is charge. As we go down the group, the charge of the nucleus increases. Consider how many protons we have in the top atom compared to the bottom one. We know that increasing charge increases the ionization energy. So now we're in a bit of a dilemma. Because on one side, we're saying that as we go down the group, because distance and shielding is increasing, it should be easier to remove the electron. And at the same time, we're saying that charge is increasing. We should make it difficult to remove the electron. The answer is that distance and shielding outweigh the increase in charge in this case. So the trend is that ionization energy decreases as you go down a group. And here's the explanation in case they ask you in an exam. So down the group, the atoms get bigger because there are more shells and overall there's going to be a weaker attraction from the nucleus to the outermost electron. Okay, let's move on to the next trend, across a period. In this case, we'll pick period two. So what happens to the first ionization energy across period two? To answer that, we're going to refer to distance, shielding and charge. So as we go across period two, we know that charge increases. Lithium has three protons in its nucleus compared to neon, which has 10. Therefore, the elements on the right have the most positive nucleus. In terms of shielding, we know that all the elements in period two have two shells. That means the shielding is going to be the same across the period. All the outermost electrons have one shell between them and the nucleus. So we're going to ignore this factor for this trend. The final thing to consider is this. We know on the right, neon has the most positive nucleus. That means it's going to have the most attractive effect on its electrons so it will be able to pull its electrons closer. This means that elements on the right, although they all have two shells, the ones on the right are going to be slightly smaller because they're pulling all their electrons inwards. Meaning, as we go from the left to the right side, the atomic radius or the distance between the nucleus and outermost electron becomes smaller. So overall, this electron will require the most energy to remove. And this one will require the least amount of energy to remove. So the general trend is that ionization energy increases as we go from left to right. And here's the explanation. So as we go from left to right, we have a greater nuclear charge. Or we can say there are more protons. These two are the same point. Also, we have the same amount of shielding. However, the atomic radius gets smaller as we go towards the right. And finally, there's a stronger attraction between the nucleus and outer shell. So use these points if you ever have to explain the general trend 
in the first ionization energy across a period. OK, so this general trend can be represented in this diagram. We said that as we go across a period, the first ionization energy increases. However, it's not completely linear. It actually looks something like this. We can see that there's one point over here where it drops from beryllium to boron, or we can say from group two to group three, and it drops again from nitrogen to oxygen, or group five to group six. So we're going to take our data, and first of all, I'm going to split this into this. So we can see that lithium and beryllium are in the S block, and the other elements are in the P block. So we're going to use this to explain why there are two drops in the ionization energy across a period, starting with beryllium and boron. When we go from beryllium to boron, the outermost electron in beryllium is in an S subshell, whereas the outermost electron in boron is in a P subshell. Electrons in the P subshell are in a higher state of energy, or we can say they experience more shielding, which means that they have a weaker nuclear attraction, and therefore they have a lower ionization energy. And we can see in the diagram, boron should be higher than beryllium, but actually it's lower. The next one is from nitrogen to oxygen. Now here we can see that they're both in the P subshell, so we can't use the same reasoning as we used before for beryllium and boron. So why does oxygen have a lower ionization energy than nitrogen, when it should be higher according to our trend? To explain that, let's look at the P subshell in a bit more detail. We're going to look at the first four elements, boron, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. Now we know that the P subshell is made of three orbitals. And that's why we have three boxes next to each element. Remember that one orbital can hold up to two electrons. So starting with boron, boron has only got one electron in the P subshell. So we're going to put one line there. Carbon has two electrons in the P subshell. So the first electron comes here. The second electron is going to occupy an empty orbital instead of going in the one which has already got an electron. Remember, electrons hate each other, so they want to be as far away from each other as possible. Nitrogen has three electrons in the P subshell, so one, two, three, as far away from each other as possible. Oxygen has four, one, two, three. Now, when the fourth one's about to come, you can see that there's already three orbitals which each have an electron. That means it's going to have to share an orbital with another electron. OK, now let's focus on nitrogen and oxygen specifically. This is the outermost electron in nitrogen, and this one is an oxygen. The outermost electron in nitrogen is very comfortable where it's at, because it's alone in its own orbital. The outermost electron in oxygen, however, is not very comfortable because it's sharing an orbital with another electron who hates it. So if I gave these outermost electrons an option to leave, which one would be more inclined to leave? The one in nitrogen or the one in oxygen? We know it's going to be the one in oxygen. It will leave very easily, requiring less energy. And that's why there's a drop in oxygen's first ionization energy compared to nitrogen. So how do we explain this? Here's how. We're going to say that oxygen's outermost electron is paired in a p orbital. Paired electrons repel each other. And therefore, less energy is needed to remove this electron. So we've covered two trends in ionization energies. In the next video, we're going to look at the third one. Hey guys, if that video helped you, support our channel by liking, subscribing and sharing it with your friends. And more importantly, 
If you still have questions, drop a post on our forum at examqa.com, where I will personally be there to help answer your questions. Mohammed signing out.